Most certainly appreciate your presence today here in the Northside Baptist Church. Welcome every one of you. And we appreciate any visitor that's visiting with us today. May the Lord bless you. And you that's listening out in the radio listening audience, we most certainly appreciate you tuning in to Northside Baptist Church Hour. Come to you right from the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church. Now this is Preacher Edward speaking. We're hoping today we can be a real inspiration to every one of you. And you in the radio listening audience, if you call someone and have them to tune in and get the Northside Baptist Church Hour, we'll try our best to be a blessing to them. Now, if you have your Bibles, turn to the book of Exodus chapter 17. Exodus chapter 17 for the reading of God's Word today. And I want to speak to you on this thought, the battle with Amalek. Now we're having a battle with Amalek today. We need to find out more about it. Turn to Exodus chapter 17. While you're turning there, let me say just a word to the radio list and audience. We're trying to expound the book of Revelation verse by verse on our daily broadcast. And if you're not getting the daily broadcast, if you're tuned to this station where you're now listening... You can get the daily broadcast from 11.30 until 12 every day. And we're making a study of the book of Revelation. We're expounding the scriptures from that great book verse by verse. And if you'll take your Bible and follow me each day, I'm sure we can learn together from the scriptures. So you tune to this station where you're now listening and get the daily broadcast Monday through Saturday at 11.30 each day. And it is a faith ministry. That means I depend on all the congregation of the children of Israel journeyed from the wilderness of sin at their journeys according to the commandment of the Lord and pitched in Riffendom and there was no water for the people to drink. Wherefore the people did chide with Moses and said give us water that we may drink. And Moses said unto them why chide ye with me? Wherefore do you tempt the Lord? And the people thirsted there for water, and the people murmured against Moses and said, Wherefore is this that thou hast brought us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our cattle with, with thirst? And Moses cried unto the Lord, said, What shall I do unto this people? For they be almost ready to stone me. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go on before the people. And take with thee of the of the with thee of the elders of Israel and thy rod, wherewith thou smootest the river, take in thine head and go. Behold, I will stand before thee upon the rock in Horeb, and thou shalt smite the rock, and the, that and there shall come water out of it that the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. And he called the name of the place Maser Meribah. Because of the children of Israel, and because they tempted the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? Then came Amalek, and fought with Israel in riffing them. And Moses said unto Joshua, Choose us out men, and go out, and fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill, and with the rod of God in my hand. So Joshua did as Moses had said to him, and fought with Amalek, and Moses and Aaron and Hur went up to the top of the hill. And it came to pass when Moses held up his hand, that Israel prevailed, and when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands were heavy, and they took a stone, and put it under him, and he sat thereon, and Aaron and Hur stayed up his hands, the one on the one side and the other on the other side. And his hands were steady unto the going down of the sun. And Joshua discomfited Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. And the Lord said unto Moses, Write this for a memorial in a book, and rehearse it in the ears of Joshua, for I will utterly put out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. And Moses built an altar, and call the name of it Jehovah Nisser, for he said, Because the Lord is sworn that the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. Now today I want to speak to you 
on the subject, the battle with Amalek. Now you have a dual nature. That fleshly nature of yours is a type of Amalek, or we should say Amalek is a type of that uh, uh, fleshly nature of yours. Now you have the dual nature, and of course you have, I mean, you do have the dual nature, which consists of the inner man and the outward man. I'm reminded of the preacher that visited a home, and the mother asked him in and told him to have a seat and excuse her. She had a few things to do, and she had a little boy there in the home with all ears, of course. And when the preacher sat down, the little boy began to walk around his chair looking at him from every angle and he kind of irritated the preacher and he said to the little fellow he said son what are you looking for and he said well uh, mama said you you were two-faced so i was just trying to find the other face well the little fellow was sincere about what he was doing and he's looking for two faces so we find here in the believer you have two natures. You have the divine nature and you have, of course, the fleshly nature. And Amalek here is a type of that Adamic nature, the outward man. And you must keep that in mind. Now, Amalek was a grandson of Esau. And the Bible said Esau was a man of the flesh. If you will read the book of Esther, you will find in that book two names. One, Mordecai, which was a descendant of Saul. And you'll find wicked Haman, a descendant of Amalek. Now the name Amalek simply means warlike. Now you're going to have a battle with Amalek as long as you live on this earth. Now you have those today that teach error, that teach that whenever you get saved, then you can get sanctified, then you can get, you can receive the Holy Ghost and so forth. And they contend that when you get sanctified, that the old Adamic nature is annihilated and you'll have no more trouble with the old Adamic nature. Now the only thing wrong with that, it just isn't so. Those dear people have been shot a curb and taught error by those that teach false doctrine. Now you do not get rid of the flesh when you get saved. You'll live in that body as long as you dwell on the earth. Now you will have a battle with that body, the Adamic nature, but it's up to you to bring it into subjection and bring it under control by the help of the Lord and the power of God's Spirit. Now Amalek here, a wicked group of people, of course is one of the bitter enemies of Israel. That caused Israel a lot of trouble. And we're going to find out about that. Now remember as I talk about Amalek, you must remember that Amalek is a type of the outward man, the Adamic nature of the flesh in which you dwell. If you're saved, you have in you a divine nature. And that means you have a dual nature. You have the Adamic and the divine. So you keep that in mind. Now when Israel marched out across the, the desert from Egypt, across the Red Sea and into the desert, headed toward the land of Canaan, Amalek was the first nation to attack Israel. Now remember, they came from descendants of Esau. Esau was their grandfather, and they are of the flesh, and they're wicked. And of course, they're the first nation, the very first nation, to attack Israel after Israel left the land of Egypt. In Numbers chapter 24 and verse 20, And when he looked on Amalek, he took up his parable and said, Amalek, was the first of the nations, but his latter end shall be that he perished forever. And Amalek, when they saw Israel marching into the wilderness, they came out of their place to engage Israel in a fight. Now that's the first thing that happens to you when you get saved. Your real first enemy 
Your real number one problem is really not the devil. He, he's behind it, but your real number one problem is your flesh. That's the first thing that's going to give you trouble when you get saved. You're going to say, well, I don't feel exactly like I'm saved. Oh, I don't feel this, or I don't feel that. I don't feel like I can hardly make it day after day. And the devil will put doubts in your minds through the flesh, and you'll have trouble with yourself when you first get saved. That'll be your battle. There'll be those doubts. There'll be an attack from the flesh. The temptations will come along that you watched our practice before you were saved, and these things will continuously bother you as a young Christian. That's old Amalek. He'll give you trouble and you'll have trouble with yourself when you first get saved. That was the first nation to attack Israel. Secondly, I want you to notice the time element in this attack. Now Amalek was sure the time, the attack, exactly at the right time. The time element here is important. I want you to notice that. Now he attacked Israel first after the drinking from the rock. The drinking from the rock is a type of salvation and the fullness of God's Spirit. In Exodus chapter 17 and verse 6, Behold, I will stand before thee upon the rock of Horeb. Thou shalt smite the rock, and there shall come water out of it, and the people may drink. And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. Now Amalek did not bother Israel until they had drank them from that rock, which is a type of salvation in one sense and a type of the fullness of God's Spirit in another. So the devil is not going to bother you. You're not going to have trouble with the flesh until you drink of the rock. And then when you feel with God's Spirit, that'll be the time when the devil is going to really wait in on you through the efforts of the flesh. Now he'll do that. Not only after the drink of the rock, but also after the eating of the manna. Now the manna is a type of the bread of life, which is a type of Christ. The devil doesn't bother unsaved people in that respect. And you're not going to be troubled with the Adamic nature until after you eat the manner and drink from the rock. That is, until after you get saved and you have the indwelling spirit in you and begin to feed on the Word of God, then immediately Amalek is going to give you trouble. He'll certainly do that. In 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 4, Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature. And so when you partake of the divine nature, that is the drinking from the rock, eating of the manner, or receiving Christ, we'd say that's what we do, and fill with God's Spirit, that's when you're going to have trouble with Amalek. Now the Apostle Paul said in Romans chapter 7, you ought to read that when you have time, and especially verses 15 to 25, Romans chapter 7, Paul said, What I wanted to do, I found myself not doing that. And that I did not want to do, I found myself doing that. And whenever I wanted to find good, I found evil present. And when I tried to do something for God in a spiritual way, the old man hindered me. The flesh bothered me. And Paul said there, when I wanted to do good, I had a battle with old man Paul. Now Paul was getting along pretty well, but he discovered he had an enemy. He had troubles. He had problems. And that problem was Paul's flesh, Paul himself. And if you be honest, you'll have to admit that you have more problems with yourself than you do any other one individual. Now you can blame your problems on others. You can put up all kinds of excuses, but when you get right down to the nitty gritty, you're going to find that you have more problems with yourself than you do anyone else. 
And if you want to really take a good look at your own problem, when you get home, you walk before the mirror and take a look. If you want to, you can either smile or frown at it, just whatever you want to do. But anyway, you'll see your biggest problem when you stand before the mirror. The devil will use your flesh, the Adamic nature, the outward man, to give you a fit. The devil doesn't bother the average church member today. Now, did you get that? The devil doesn't bother the average church member today. He just lets the flesh take care of them. They have the problems with themselves. And it's the flesh that's giving them these problems. And then if they really get filled with the Spirit of God and the Word of God and set out to do something for God, that's when the devil begins to take a second look and decides to do something about it. But the average church member today, he's troubled with the world and the flesh, and the devil doesn't bother him, doesn't have to. He's got him out here in the world. He's got him walking in the lust of the flesh, and he's enticed by the pleasure of this world, and the devil doesn't have to bother him. But don't forget, if you decide to do something for God in spite of the flesh in the world, that's where the devil comes in to do something about it to hinder you. Now, it was Amalek who first attacked Israel. Now, it didn't say that Israel attacked Amalek. Amalek first attacked Israel. Amalek first attacked Israel. Not Israel, Amalek. Now, you must keep that in mind. And it's the flesh that first attacks you. Now, you must remember that. The Bible says in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 17, For the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. So it is the flesh that begins to dig in against the spirit. And then, of course, it is the spirit then that opposes the flesh, but it's the flesh that takes off after you, first of all, after the spiritual phase of your life. And he does that, of course, when you get saved. After Jordan comes the giants. You don't find Israel fighting the giants in the wilderness. There were no giants in the wilderness. They found those giants after they crossed Jordan, and Jordan is a type of the spirit-filled life. And you're not going to run into any giants until you feel with God's Spirit. And when you feel with God's Spirit, then here comes the giants. Now you must remember that. Number three, let's notice how Israel engaged Amalek in battle. Israel, the little nation of Israel here, is fighting against Amalek. Now Amalek attacked Israel. And so they go to the top of the hill. In my text in verse 11, it came to pass when Moses held up his hand that Israel prevailed, and when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. Now when they went to the top of the hill, Moses held his hands up as long as he could, signifying he was depending on God. He was reaching toward heaven. He was looking to the Lord to help him. But his hands became heavy. And he began to drop his hands. And we could hold them up no longer. Down they went. And then Amalek prevailed against Israel. Now watch these scriptures. In Psalms chapter 28 and verse 2. Hear the voice of my supplications when I cry to thee. When I lift up my hands toward the holy oracle. David said, I prayed, and I lifted up my hands. If you have never prayed and lifted up your hands, you ought to try that. Just stand and look toward heaven and lift your hands as high as you can and pray. Try it, see how it works. The Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 8, 
I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. There's something about raising your hands toward heaven when you pray. The devil doesn't lie. That insinuates you're reaching toward heaven. You're looking to God for the answer. Moses' hands grew very heavy. In verse 12, Moses' hands were heavy. In Luke chapter 18 and verse 1, he spake a parable and then said to this end, that men ought always to pray and not to faint. As his hands grew heavy, they began to drop, as I said a moment ago. And then only as he raised his hands could he overcome Amalek. Not only was he overcoming Amalek by the upheld hands, but also by the edge of the sword, which is a type of the Word of God. If you overcome Amalek, if you overcome the flesh, you're going to have to do it by the Word of God and through prayer. The Bible says in verse 13, And Joshua discomfited Amalek, his people, with the edge of the sword. In Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12, For the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. And so you overcome the Adamic nature, the old man, the flesh, through the word of God and prayer. In Matthew chapter 4 and Luke chapter 4, when the devil came and tempted Jesus after he fasted 40 days and nights, Jesus quoted from the book of Deuteronomy and said, Get thee behind me, Satan, it is written. There he used the word of God to overcome the enemy. And so Jesus did that and overcame the enemy. The Bible says Aaron and Hur upheld Moses' arms. Verse 12. And Aaron and Hur stayed up his hands, the one on one side and the one on the other. When Moses could no longer hold up his hands, they became so heavy. Aaron came and stood on one side of Moses. Hur came and stood on the other side of Moses. They raised his hands up. And when they did, Israel began to overcome the enemy, Amalek. And as long as they upheld his hands, he won the battle. Every church member ought to uphold the hands of their pastor in prayer as he preaches the word of God. Aaron here was a high priest, and her here means light. And so the priest represents the spirit and her represents light. So it's through the light of God's word and the spirit of God that we prevail. That's the way we overcome. And so uphold your pastor's hands through prayer as he preaches the word of God. Number four, Joshua did not destroy but only discomfited Amalek. Now when Joshua the general went in, he did not destroy that nation. He only discomfited them. The Bible says in verse 13, and Joshua discomfited Amalek and his people the edge of the sword. Now the old man is not annihilated. You only discomfort him. You only bring him under subjection. You only suppress him and crucify him and consider him dead. That's the only way to overcome the flesh. He's still there. It's up to you to wrestle him down through prayer and the word of God. That's the way it's done. And so Joshua discomfited them with the edge of the sword. The Bible says in Galatians 5, 17, For the flesh lusts against the spirit, the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary one to another. That doesn't sound like the old man is annihilated. People that preach and teach that the old man and the flesh are annihilated at any time during this life, they are preaching and teaching untruth, error, false doctrine. You'll have the flesh to contend with as long as you live. Now, some of these good sisters that talk about the flesh being annihilated and they have no problems with their damning nation, don't cross them about their children. They'll scratch your eyes out in a minute. They'll lose their temper and bowl you out in just a few minutes. And yet they say, the old flesh has been annihilated. I live above sin. 
I'm absolutely holy. Just don't cross them. You'll find out how holy they are. And of course, if you look real close, you, you won't find any pin feathers. You might find some little short horns, but not any pin feathers. They have been taught false doctrine, been made a gang of Pharisees. They're stuck on themselves. They're further away from God than they realize. And so uh, don't, don't you believe a word of that. It's false doctrine. It's not true. You'll deceive yourself. If you think the flesh has been annihilated and you get out here and old damn nature rises up, then you're going to say there's something wrong somewhere and, the, and immediately the devil will tell you you're not saved. That's the first thing he'll tell you to confuse you and wreck you if he can. In Romans chapter 7 and verse 23, Paul said, If I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind. That doesn't sound like the flesh is annihilated. In Exodus chapter 17 and verse 16, for he said, Because the Lord has sworn that the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. So you're going to have trouble. You'll have a battle with your flesh as long as you live on this earth. You won't get above that temptation until you get your glorified body. And you better believe that. Now we come to thought number five, and that is how Amalek attacks the Christian. How does your flesh attack you in the first place? You need to know. In Deuteronomy chapter 25, verses 17 and 18, remember what Amalek did unto thee, by the way, when you were coming out of Egypt. How he met thee, by the way, and smote thee, how most part of thee, even all that were feeble among thee, when they was faint and weary, and he feared not God. This little nation watched the Israelites until they marched by, and they came in from the rear and caught those that were weak and those who were feeble and those that was down and out and did not have much strength. And that's why they attacked the Israel. That's exactly where Amalek will attack you. He will attack you at your weakest point. There's not a one of you sitting here today, and there's not a one of you out in the radio listening audience, if you're a born-again believer, but what could not uh, speak up in a matter of moments and name your besetting sin? You can name that sin that gives you more trouble than any other sin in your life. That is your weakest point. That's why Amalek attacks, and he knows that. Nobody knows any better than the devil where your weakest point is. He studies your life, and he knows. And that's exactly where he's going to strike you, not at your strongest point, but your weakest point. That's what Amalek did here for Israel. And it says here in 1 Samuel 15, 2, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I remember that which Amalek did to Israel, how he lay in wait for him in the way when he came up out of Egypt. And so he watched them and found their weakest point and attacked it there. In Philippians chapter 3 and verse 3, For we of the circumcision which worship in the spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus have no confidence in the flesh. You have the Adamic nature, you have the divine nature, there's a constant battle between the two. God said, yield to the inner man, the divine nature, bring into subjection the outward man, and keep him down, keep him crucified, consider him dead, bring him in subjection. That's your battle that you will have to fight daily. The apostle Paul said, I die daily. And he had to die to himself every day. Now God said, smite Amalek. And 1 Samuel 15, 3, now God and said, Smite Amalek, and utterly destroy all that they have, and spare them not, but slay both man and woman, infant and suckling, ox and sheep, camel and ass. Here we find that God told King Saul, whenever he attacked Amalek, to slay them all. Don't spare a one of them. That means you can't trust the flesh in any manner, not any part of it. You must consider yourself completely dead, every part of you, in order to live as unto God as you, as you should. Now, Paul got into trouble because he spared 
old King Agag and some of the best of the flock. And it cost him his kingship. In 1 Samuel chapter 15 and verse 9, But Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep and the oxen of the fatland and the lambs, all that was good. So they played around in sparing Agag and the best of flock, and God told them not to do it, to destroy all of Agag, everything that he had, but they didn't destroy it all, and it really cost King Saul. Now finally, God will utterly annihilate Amalek, but that will be when you get your glorified body. In Exodus chapter 17 and verse 14, And the Lord said unto Moses, Write this for memorial in a book, and rehearse it in the air of Joshua, for I will utterly put out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. You'll be completely rid of Amalek of the flesh when you get your glorified body. In Philippians chapter 3, verses 20 and 21, He said, Our conversations in heaven, for which also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able to subdue all things unto himself. You now have a vile body. That's the Amalek part of you. But there's a day coming when you'll have a glorified body like unto the Lord. Now when uh, uh, Jacob came to die, Joseph came before his father Jacob, and it was customary for a patriarch to bless the descendants upon whom he's going to restore the blessing before he died. Joseph came before his father Jacob, bringing Manasseh and Ephraim. Manasseh was the firstborn, and he was in line for the blessing. So we find Joseph came, he put Manasseh at Jacob's right hand, Ephraim at his left hand. The old man was blind. But at the same time, he knew what he, he should do. He crossed his arms, and he put his right hand on Ephraim, and his left hand on Manasseh. Uh, Joseph said, Dad, you, you're mistaken there. You're putting your, the right hand on the wrong head, the wrong person. He said, No, my son. No, no. I know what I'm doing. He said, Ephraim is going to get the blessing, and he'll be greater than Manasseh. And through the symbol of the cross, by him crossing his hands, he put the right hand on Ephraim and the left hand on Manasseh, and Ephraim, the younger, received the blessings instead of the Manasseh, the elder. First the flesh, then the spirit. First the outward man, then the inward man. And so it's the inward man with whom we have to do today, and through the cross of Jesus, we can defeat the outward man and yield to the inward man, and that's where you get your blessing. And so you...